Hey guys, we're gonna answer that question. Do I really need to love people? Is that what I'm called to do when I'm a follower of Jesus? And it really answers the biblical question we find in Genesis where it says, Am I my brother's keeper? When God would go to Cain after he murdered his brother Abel and he'd say, hey, where's your brother? And he answers that, that kind of cocky response of, am I my brother's keeper? Well, we're gonna answer that in this video. Roll that. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David, welcome to the channel. I'm all about putting out content that is entertaining, encouraging, uplifting, inspiring, so that you can take your next steps with Jesus. Follow me on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, I'll put the, the handles up there, but I'm a pastor at a church in Florida, and we're on the east coast of Florida, where it's called East Coast Christian Center. I serve some amazing church leadership, where we are all about getting the gospel to our community and watching the local church change the world and we do it one community at a time so we have online services i want to encourage you man check out one of our online services also we have a radio program that's also a podcast called morning breath where we go into a chapter of the bible and we we take it apart we don't prepare a message we just look at what god breathes on our hearts we read it the night before then they and we talk about it and we put it out it's a great way for a personal kind of devo kind of way for you to walk through a chapter of scripture maybe you didn't understand you'll hear two pastors that love jesus and guess what love you talk about that chapter so but you're here to talk about do i really need to love my neighbor do i really need to love people or am i my brother's keeper if you put it in biblical terms so let's jump into that all right so one of the biggest things one of the biggest scriptures let's take a look at first it's simply you know what the the, the the golden rule, the biggest commandment, what God says to us, the great commandment, the loving, love thy neighbor. Let me read it to you here. It says, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, New King James Version. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hangs all the law and the prophets right there it says you need to love your neighbor we've all heard that one we all get it but it's difficult it can be a struggle he's saying hey and even another point they might ask the question well who is my neighbor that notice he doesn't just say brother he takes it up a notch and he says neighbor because a brother would be anybody that's in the body of christ with you in your tribe even biologically you could take it blood brother there would fit but when you say neighbor that's who's ever in your community and that is such a struggle because we can see now there's so many people in our communities that believe differently than us but it goes so much much deeper because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he does not change. And Jesus is God in human form. So when he says this, he's actually also referring to something much deeper and much more, and that needs to be much more ingrained into our hearts as we look at it. So let's take a look at your favorite and my favorite Old Testament prophet. You got it? What were you going to say? Isaiah, Ezekiel, what were you going to say? Obadiah. Let's jump to Obadiah. So you're like, Pastor, why are we in Obadiah? Who is Obadiah? Kind of a dope name, probably hard to spell in the first grade, but either way, Obadiah writes a one chapter accusation, judgment, prophetic word against the country of Edom. And in this, you can see how God does not change and a severity and how serious God is about loving your neighbor. But to understand this, you have to understand a little bit of back history. But let me read a scripture for you real quick before we jump into the back history. And it's this, it's Obadiah 10, 10. For violence against your brother, Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever forever all right that's what he says let's find out why though so breaking down obadiah he, he is writing to the country of edom and what's happening is babylon has come in to crush israel and in doing so edom who had this weird awkward relationship with israel they didn't like each other but yet they were still kind of kindred with each other and he would talk about your brother jacob here in verse 10 uh, in verse 10 so to explain that is edom actually comes from the descendants of an old school guy named Esau, who was the brother of Jacob. And 
in their relationship, you know they were really tense, okay? A lot of bitterness in Esau's heart towards Jacob. They make up at the end of the story on a level, but as Esau would go and start his own country of Edom, Jacob would become Israel, and we would see Jesus come through that lineage. The bitterness kind of didn't stop. Real forgiveness didn't enter in, and you can see the friction between Israel and Edom, and then finally where Babylon comes to destroy Israel because of its sin, Edom is doing something that you and me are a little bit guilty of, and that is they're kind of watching on as Israel is being defeated. They're not helping out. And actually they get to the point where when Israel is leaving, Israel is fleeing, Israel is going to do, to get away, they're actually cutting them off in the streets and killing them down. They're looking to capitalize on Israel's defeat. And that is a horrible thing. Let's apply that to today. So how does that apply to our life? It's like this. Are you looking on while other people are struggling and suffering and you're going into your church on Sunday morning, you're singing Waymaker, you're singing Oceans, you're putting your hands in the air, but you have got no desire to actually see someone get breakthrough, to actually help them. Matter of fact, you might have bitterness in your heart towards a person. As a pastor, but I'm not above this. I've had this. I've had, you know, I'm a young adult pastor. I'm a college pastor. I see young, handsome guys come in that, you know, fill with the word and the what, what might rise up in me might be like, oh man, are they are they going to be the next pastor? Does, do people want to make them that? Are they going to look at them and not me? The truth is that's a lie from the devil and it winds up getting garbage in your heart that comes out and it affects how you lead and love people. As a matter of fact, I like to pour into people where I see anointings because I want to raise up 100 replacements, 1,000 replacements for me because those are all people that can go out and get the gospel to people. My position and my place is not mine. It was given to me by my heavenly father. It's his. It's his throne that we sit on. It's, it's his anointing that he's given you for you to use. But we see it throughout all of Christianity. If a young woman comes into a church and all of a sudden all the guys are looking at her or talking about her or something, the women of the church might come around like a bunch of clucking hens and start talking about it. I'm just being real here, people. Start talking about it. She doesn't stand a chance of making it in that church. Why? Because the spirit of Edom, that mindset of bitterness, that mindset to say, hey, rather than helping someone with their breakthrough, we're going to watch and look to capitalize on whenever devastation comes into their life. You know, if that young lady goes for the worship team or goes for something and you see God's moving in their life, too often Christians are actually more focused to be like, oh, well, brother, did you see what she wore last Sunday to church? Maybe somebody needs to talk to her. Maybe somebody needs to talk to you, okay? Maybe we all need to sit down and say, where has bitterness come in? Where have we become this brother country to a person that God is moving in and we're looking at what they're doing instead of where they've come from and helping them to get to where God is calling them? That's where Christ-like. That's what it means to be Christ-like. That's what it means to actually love on people, all right? We are responsible. You see, God says in the 10th verse, he's like, man, I'm going to cut you guys down. You sat as my people and my family were getting destroyed. And I know if you're a theologian, you might say, hey, well, God also sent Babylon. Guess what? He might have sent Babylon because of the sin of an issue between him and Israel, but he was doing a work in Israel, okay? And he's doing a work in you, and he's doing a work in that other person. But I don't want to be the type of Christian that just stands by as a man comes into my church and is struggling with addictions, is struggling with self-worth, and is struggling with everything else this world puts on him. And because I have bitterness towards his type of person, or maybe you might be a Republican, you might be Democrat, you might be black, you might be white, it might be you can go throughout all of the examples, okay? And you might say, hey, I have reason to maybe not want to connect. I'd be okay if they never came back to my church. That's brokenness. We cannot have that as the body of Christ because you can see from the picture of of when Jesus says, hey, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love God, love thy neighbor. He's like, this sounds of all the law and the prophets. This is the real deal. You see him in the, in the Old Testament saying, hey, listen, you've got to understand, I'm not cool if those of us who know Jesus just sit by, just sit by and watch as other people go to destruction. God does not like that. But let's take a look at one more verse because I kind of want to end on a high note, not like all like, 
in kind of a closing for this. Remember the story Jesus would tell? He'd tell this cool story. And it's uh, about a good Samaritan. Your, pra- your pastors preach it. I've preached it. We've all preached it. Mega church pastors have preached it. And it's always from the connotation of, hey, there's this traveler. Okay. He gets beat up, knocked down. Here comes these religious guys. One passes by. Another passes by. They don't take care of them. Or comes this Samaritan, as we know, to be people that aren't accepted or liked by Israel. And, and, and they help out this, this hurt and wounded person. They provide shelter for him, provision for him, pay his debts. And usually the tie-in to that is, hey, you need to be a good Samaritan and help your brother, right? That's kind of what I've been ranting about for this whole whole deal is, is help your brother. We are responsible. Yes, we are our brother's keeper. But that's not necessarily, and that's not exactly the point of the Good Samaritan story. You see, you and me are that traveler that's beat down, okay? Jesus is the Good Samaritan who has come, who has bandaged our wounds, provided protection for us, paid the way for us, and has taken care to redeem and restore us. Because even in the book of Obadiah, it ends not just with God's judgment and punishment, but the full circle of God, his restoration plan. You have to understand that, that God is not just a God of wrath and punishment, but he is the God of reconciliation and restoration. And he wants that for your life. And he wants to do that in others' lives through you, which makes you your brother's keeper. And we have to be excited about that. We have to have true passion and joy to say, man, you know what? This is amazing. I get to see God work in other people's stories. There is nothing more beautiful than seeing breakthrough in other people's marriages, other people's kids, other people's testimonies. When you see their hands raised for the first time in worship, when you see them come up from being baptized, when you see them operating in their anointing, when you see them stepping out in faith, you become the biggest kingdom of heaven, you know, cheerleader it could be. And I don't care who you are. That is the greatest joy you can probably experience. And it's amazing. And don't miss out on it because we've allowed a bitterness, a spirit of Edom and Esau and self-focus and being worried how we're going to make it. We're not going to make it. It's by his spirit, not by our strength and by our might. So I encourage you today, man, take your eyes off yourself. Put it on that person that needs your help. Let's get the gospel to people. That's what we're called to do. It's absolutely, absolutely our job to be our brother's keeper. Now you pray to God and you ask him, you ask me, hey, who am I supposed to take care of? Who have you called for me to do this? And and who 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 am I responsible for and who I'm not? All right. And you look at that and I'll do one last three quick little things before we sign out here for before we end this video. It's, there's really kind of three types of people that I when I train young pastors up that I, I kind of say are in the congregation. And that's when you got the sheep. They're, they're the people that God's called us to pastor and, and guide and lead and take care of and shepherd. And though they're awesome. But then you have the goats. You see goats, goats aren't bad, but goats like to bump heads. Okay. They're the person that complains about the worship music. They're the person that complains about your outfit. There's a person that complains about the tithe message. There's a person that complains. And they're not bad. They're not bad. You know, um, but they're goats and goats are usually probably just someone else's sheep that's slipped into your congregation and you love on them. You love on them. But what happens is people get a goat or a person that they look at and they got struggle with and they make them a wolf. They make them a wolf. You said that's the third one, a wolf. And that is what gets the rod. That's what gets, no, get out of here because you've been sent by the devil to destroy. And that's the person that's looking usually to steal and distract from the gospel with their intentions, not their outfits, okay, but their intentions, And usually you can feel it with the spirit of discernment. So pray to God and say, hey, who's the sheep you've called me to? All right, who's the sheep? Who, because I want to take care of, I want to see them. Everybody's called to be a pastor. I love that. Maybe not the Ephesians 4, 11 version, but you're called to lead and you're called to influence and you're called to be your brother's keeper. So I'll tell you what, man, thanks. Thanks for checking out this video. Man, this has blessed you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and TikTok and the other platforms. I try and put different content out on different stuff. Also trying to show you my life so that you can see that I'm a real person and that this isn't a fake and this isn't a front, but I truly care about you. I truly care about your story. Drop in the comments below if you want me to teach on anything else and check out some of my other videos, guys. But that's from my heart to you today. I hope you take your next step with Jesus. Love you guys.